I'm Dr. Krista Neff, and you are listening to The Soul of Life. I would even say to myself, you are a simpleton. You are just trying to simplify everything because you're, maybe you're lazy. You know, maybe you just don't want to keep remembering the DSM, all these details. Today on The Soul of Life, I speak to Dr. Daniel Siegel. The pattern that emerged was people either came with chaos or rigidity or both. Renowned psychiatrist and innovator who created a field of study called interpersonal neurobiology. I made up the word mindsight to try to remind myself that, you know, the mind is real. Dr. Siegel is the author of more than a dozen books about the mind and emotional development and has been a passionate leader in our field, pushing us to define consciousness in the mind as something more than just the circular stock definition that the mind is simply the function of the brain. There was no definition of the mind that anybody had. And he's challenged the shockingly prevalent belief that we shouldn't even attempt to define what the mind is. Just because something's not visible to the eye doesn't make it unreal. Unlike many self-help psychology authors, much of Dan's writing dares to synthesize vast and complex subjects like the brain, quantum physics, consciousness, and the soul. Maybe the mind could be an emergent property. One of the emergent properties a complex system is called self-organization. I asked Dan whether he agrees with my observation that the fields of science and spiritual traditions have been increasingly overlapping in their quest for the truth. And Dan describes how your sense of you in your mind can be described by quantum physics, which is the study of matter and energy at their most fundamental level. When you look at all the different theories about Consciousness, they're always about the linking of differentiated parts. The dance is created by the dancers together. Dan and I talk about how his work in interpersonal neurobiology meshes with and helps us understand how the increasingly popular form of psychotherapy, Dick Schwartz's internal family systems therapy, works in the brain. The hub of the wheel is a metaphor for the plane of possibility in the physics perspective on what the mind is. And for Dick, that exactly corresponds to his capital S self. I talked to Dan about the first and only time he co-led a two-day workshop in Boston several years ago with Dick Schwartz. I was one of the hundred or so people in those rooms that weekend, so I distinctly remember both Dan's affirmation and his critique of IFS. So this is where Dick and I may differ, I don't know. Certainly some of his students see the parts as things that need to stay intact. But in the interpersonal neurobiology framework, we see them as, you know, temporary amalgamations as a plateau. So for us, no, you don't keep parts intact. If you're a fan of IFS like I am, I hope you can listen closely to what Dan is offering in his feedback about how much certainty we should have with any form of our practice. It's as if he's saying, be careful how religious you become about practicing anything, even something as elegant and sexy as IFS. I think we have to be very careful of any kind of model when we glorify or reify things in their noun-like certainty. The problem I have with the word part is it can be interpreted as a noun. We're not knocking nouns. Sometimes you gotta live as a noun, like when you drive your car, Your car is a noun-like thing. When it comes to the red light, press on the noun-like brakes. You don't become one with everything. Welcome to The Soul of Life. I'm Keith Miller, and this is episode three of season four, Dr. Daniel Siegel. And I literally, it was four in the morning, I literally fell off my chair. I said, oh my God, that's really weird. There was no definition of the mind that anybody had. I'm Keith Miller. That's really weird. Can we swear on this? Something you hear at a swing party. (laughs) (laughs) That sounds fun. We don't treat trauma. We treat the imprint of traumatic experience. I stood on top of the Olympic podium, very incomplete, not happy, and never ever thinking that I was good enough. Donald watched his older brother be destroyed that way, so he had to exile all the sensitive parts of him. 
Free soloing is climbing without ropes. Alex was born for climbing. Cannabis use disorder is real. There's no question about it. The, the broccoli growers of America are livid every time that they listen to this part of your podcast. What happens before sex? What happens during sex? What happens after sex? Compassion is contagious. We've got to have cake. Oh my God, I told him bisexual and that's where I got to be. He's incredibly successful by just talking shit about people's fried rice. This is the soul of life. Hey, it's Keith Miller. I just want you to know that I've created a bunch of inexpensive and free courses on marriage improvement, mindfulness, and stress reduction. Just head on over to souloflifeshow.com forward slash courses and check out the cool resources there. Again, that's souloflifeshow.com forward slash courses. Dr. Daniel Siegel is someone I consider to be one of the most thoughtful and clear innovators in teaching and talking about neurobiology and how it affects our behaviors. And not just behaviors we can see, but the behavior in our mind, the patterns of our mind. He created a field of study within neurobiology called interpersonal neurobiology. That is how the biological processes within my body at any given time are affected and changed by the biological processes going on in the bodies of people around me, people I interact with them care for and depend upon and vice versa. I love hearing Dan speak about not just how we have healthy minds when we're connected to the various parts of us that have distinct needs, what he calls an integrated mind, like the spokes on a wheel connected to the hub. But I really love hearing him speak thoughtfully and persuasively about the linkages between physics, something we don't often think about in mental health or in health at all, actually, and qu even quantum physics, the way Energy behaves at the incredibly small subatomic sub scale and our sense of consciousness, what we could say our soul. So I'm really excited to speak with you today. Dr. Daniel Siegel, how are you? Thanks for having me, Keith. I'm doing well today and I, I hope you're doing well too. I remember, you know, I've heard you speak for, you know, going back probably 20 years. And one of my favorite things, many things that are, I would count among my favorite things to hear you speak about, but you, you know, you went to Harvard Medical School, you talk about your story, your journey, and you talk about the days of being taught um, that basically the body is a bag of chemicals and the mind and mental health is almost this sort of um, stepsister or, you know, sort of, it's like, a lesser important thing than the physical processes in the body. And I was wondering if, if you think at this point in your career, do you think medical schools are still teaching that or, or have they adopted more integration with mind and body? Unfortunately, when I talk to medical students these days, not every medical school, but many medical schools, it's still the prevalent uh, kind of view that things can be reduced down to their molecular components. And what gets lost in that is, you know, a larger aspect of human life. Does it surprise you that, that we still struggle to define what the mind is? You know, I was trained both in psychological research and in, you know, medicine and, and the, the division of medicine that deals with the mind called psychiatry. And the field of psychiatry also did not have a definition of the mind. And there were even philosophers who study the mind and philosophy of mind. They didn't have a definition of the mind. So this was just weird. So I just started this strange habit as I became an educator going around the world, you know, teaching in live workshops back in the day when we could meet in person. So I would always ask my assembled hundred people, you know, sometimes there'd be more than that, you know, in a room. And I would just record all of this because I couldn't believe what I was finding everywhere around the planet, mental health professionals, and it turned out to be true for educators too, for teachers. But for us in mental health, whatever our division, around two to 5% of people would say, yes, I was told what the mind was in my formal training, but 95% said no. And then if we had time in a workshop, I would say to the two to 5% that raised their hand, what were you told the mind is? And um, they would say things like, your mind is your thinking and your feeling. So then I would say, that's beautiful. That's a description. It doesn't say what the mind is. It says it's describing what that word is referring to. What is a, a, what is a feeling? What is a thought? And they would go, well, I don't know. It's what the mind does. You know, you get this circular thing, you know, thinking and feeling is what the mind is. 
And then what's the mind is thinking and feeling. And what's thinking and feeling is what the mind is. You know, so no one is saying what it is. So when I was hanging out with some philosophers of mind who heard a definition I had come with, uh, come up with for this group to have everyone try to stay together, uh, one of them said to me, uh, and later two others said the same exact phrase, you know, you should never define the mind is what each of them said. And I said, well, okay, well, why not? And they said, because when you define something, you limit your understanding. I said, wow, well, that's important. You don't want to limit your understanding. But if I'm a psychotherapist, if I'm a therapist of the mind and my client, my patient says to me, hey, Dan, I said, yeah, um, you're the therapist of my mind. And I go, yeah. And they go, what is my mind? And I go, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure. Or if I just say it's your thoughts and feelings, they go, tell me more than that. You know, um, anyway, so that that is, in fact, still the case. And now, you know, luckily, you know, this field I work in interpersonal neurobiology, you know, we, we offer a definition of the mind and it isn't like that definition gets put up against other definitions. And we're having these fun discussions to see what are the values of each approach and what are the limitations of each approach. There's no other definition of the mind out there still. And that definition was offered 30 years ago. I, and I wonder, and of course, I want you to maybe offer your definition of the mind. I think that would be great for people to hear. But I wonder if you've also experienced, as I have, you know, this this shift over the decades, couple couple decades that I've been practicing, towards um, scientists and psychologists being. I, I don't want to say open necessarily, starting at a spiritual p- place with spiritual language, but the idea that some of the questions that we're asking in science don't have. <laughs> Don't have answers. We can, we we as we, we're opening up more curiosity, and it leads to this place of um, openness to to things that we may not have words for, which you know has been the domain of spiritual people for a long time. I wonder, have you noticed there being being more integration between scientists and people who might not typically be associated with scientists in the spiritual communities? Yeah, you know, Keith, I think that is. True, that's a feeling, you know, and a pattern that I also, like you, have been observing. And one of the things in terms of opening up, like you're saying, is, um, you know, in the 1980s, uh, one of the things that happened, which is kind of shockingly new, because when you when you hear about it, it's actually in in indigenous teachings has been taught, you know for thousands of years. I mean, I'm here on the unceded lands of the Tongva and the Chumash. And when you look at the the oral tradition and, and the lessons that have been taught by these folks who lived here for thousands of years in, Cal- in what we call California, the indigenous teachings have always been what in science we're going to call now systems thinking. And uh, they've always seen the interdependence of parts and the importance of seeing the whole and not getting lost in the individuality of just the parts. I mean, I love medicine and I think it's, I'm a physician. I think it's really cool that you can be that deep and analytic thinker to then say, this is the artificial hip I'm inserting in this person's body because that's why they're having a problem. But it's got to be more than just the mechanics is what you're saying. Yeah. So then you have the emergent property of a complex system that says, okay, so no hip by itself dances, but now these two relatives can go to a party we're going to have and they can dance on the dance floor. The dance is created by the dancers together, right? So I came across something I had been looking for in other branches of science, not math, which was, even though I know we had the DSM and to get my board certification, I had to memorize the book and spit out the details when I took my oral exams and all that stuff. So I I knew how to study that and I knew what was in the book. But for me, the pattern that emerged was people either came with chaos or rigidity or both. Mm. And I mean, everyone, I mean, so then I started thinking, because I would ask my supervisors about it. They would look at me like I was out of my mind. Now, they didn't have a definition of my mind or any mind, but I might have been out of it. Um, And so I thought, maybe I'm out of my mind, but I couldn't stop. 
every time I see a patient, I go, well, here's chaos. Like they're flooded with emotions or flooded with memories or bodily sensations from the past of traumatic experiences. Not enough boundaries or not enough differentiation within the parts. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, then it was not clear what it was from, but that would be the chaos. And then, you know, the rigidity would be either shut down, depressed, depleted, you know, disconnecting, feeling removed, feeling, you know, apathy, you know, all these painful, painful things. So suffering, I mean, and I just started thinking, I would even say to myself, you are a simpleton. You are just trying to simplify everything because you're, maybe you're lazy. You know, maybe you just don't want to keep remembering the DSM, all these details because you're reducing everything to, you know, rigidity or chaos. I mean, that's kind of rigid too. Why can't you just follow the rules, Dan? Exactly. Believe me, I have this inner voice that (laughs) would say things like that. You know, and then getting like a fight with itself, like, well, because people just seem to be coming in with chaos or rigidity. So, I, you know, I'm reading this thing because I'm trying to just figure out how to approach this group of scientists who couldn't agree on what the mind was. And this emergence business kept on coming. And so the two things that arose from that moment in time, literally, it was a moment of we had the first meeting. They couldn't agree on what the mind was. Everyone could agree what the brain essentially was. and in the between that meeting and the next meeting, I had to figure out what to say to that group of 40 very accomplished professors that they might stay communicating with each other because they were really angry with each other. Because, you know, the anthropologists and sociologists say, oh, the mind is our social relationships and the neuroscientists in the room or some of the psychiatry oriented, you know, researchers in the room. They would say, no, 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 no. The, obviously the mind is just the brain. And they would use the just to kind of, dig at, at the social people. Yeah, we take this personally, don't we? Don't we? Like oh, totally. It's their have. life's work. Yeah, it is. You know? Yeah. So anyway, so, so the, that, you know, is what got me to just turn to this math book. I don't know why. But anyway, the, so the emergence felt like maybe the mind could be an emergent property. And then the two things that happened, one was in a math book, it said that complex systems, which are open systems that are capable of being chaotic, that are nonlinear, meaning a small input leads to a large and often very difficult, if not impossible, to predict the outcome. And I thought, well, our minds are kind of that way. We're open, we're chaos capable, we're, we're nonlinear. So I thought, okay, well, maybe we're whatever this complex system business is. Maybe that's what we are. Mm. And then I read on and it said one of the emergent properties a complex system is called self-organization. And I'm going, what? What's it? So, because I had been trained in psychopathology research and we studied self-regulation and its dysfunction in, in children and their development. And so I thought, well, now, well, hold on. Did they mean self-regulation? No, it was a math term called self-organization. So I said, okay, well, maybe that's related to self-regulation. I don't know. So let me read more. And then it said, optimal self-organization essentially creates this flexible, adaptive state of harmony. But um, when you impair optimal self-organization, and I'm, my eyes are reading these words, it says you go to either chaos or you go to rigidity. And I literally, it was four in the morning, I literally fell off my chair. I said, oh my God. This is the first time I could find that anywhere. And I said, that's really weird. That's just weird. And then I was reading more and it said, you know, optimal self-organization happens when you differentiate components of a complex system, allow them to be unique and special. To differentiate means to allow to be different. And then it said, but you got to link them. And then when you read further in the linkage, you're not losing differentiation. So it's not blending. It's really a special property that when I ultimately met with mathematicians themselves, I said, what do you call that property of balancing, differentiation, linkage. They said, well, that creates optimal self-organization. I said, yeah, I know, but what do you call it? They said, we don't call it anything. I said, yeah, but if you're working with a patient or you're working with yourself or you're teaching other people or you're sharing it with colleagues, you got to call it something. They said, just call it what it is, balancing, differentiation with linkage. I said, okay. I said, I'm going to call it integration. They said, well, we'd, we'd rather you not call it that because for us, integration is addition, in calculus. Mm. So this is not addition. I said, I know, but it's a term people can relate to. So just be aware that the word integration, we're using very specifically defining it as the differentiation of components of a complex system 
and their linkage. So then you go, okay, fine. This is what creates a flexible, adaptive, coherent, energized, and stable flow of the system. So then the next thing to address was, well, what is the system made of? And then the only thing I could come up with, and maybe it's simple-minded thinking, but the only thing I can come up with that would make us anthropologists, sociologists, and linguists who look at the relationality of mental life match with what the neuroscientist was talking about. We study, you know, basically energy sharing. So there was the commonality, energy. And I wanted to ask you about that because, yeah. you know, I, I was speaking with Dr. Jonathan Schooler just down the road at, at UC Santa Barbara about his resonance theory of consciousness. And I wonder if that's a term that makes sense also, resonance. Yeah, I mean, when you look at energy patterns, Keith, when you say you enter a room and you feel the resonance, I think you're feeling the harmonic flow of energy and information that is being shared between people and each other and between people and nature. And you can feel that literally. So number one, subjective experience can be relational. It's an emergent property. You're feeling in the energy and information flow that's in the part of a complex system. The second thing is consciousness. You know, you mentioned Schooler's notion of resonance. Well, you know, when you look at all the different theories about consciousness, they're always about the linking of differentiated parts, which is what resonance requires. It's what the integrated information theory involves. It's, you know, when you look at different studies in the brain and when you do this thing called the wheel of awareness, we have this simple integration of consciousness practice, you start seeing huge shifts in states of mind based on integrative flow. I want to just catch for people who don't understand the, the wheel of awareness that you, you de- developed a tool that allows people to focus on their attention. So attend to their attention, right? And, and I think that's what you're saying is that unlocks, that actually starts to change the properties of what you're experiencing when you attend to it. Yeah, that's an interesting entree into that whole thing. Okay, I'm going to just jump in here to speak for some editing I did to simplify. Dan told me the story about this furniture that he built in his office, which is a big circular coffee table that represents the mindfulness technique that he's most known for, which is called the wheel of awareness. It's a lot easier to see this than to have someone explain it, so I edited that part out. And I'm going to add the graphic of the wheel of awareness on the YouTube version of this conversation. So you can see that and follow along. I'll also put links to Dan's Wheel of Awareness meditation in the show notes so you can literally just follow along without getting too cerebral about the concept, which is really the whole point of the Wheel of Awareness exercise anyway. I'll say this, that let's imagine this is a wheel, spoke of the wheel, and you're going to move that thing metaphorically around the rim. And let's you know divide the rim into four segments. This is all energy flow patterns where the first segment is energy flow from outside the body you pick up with hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, touching. All the senses. All the five senses. Then you go to the interior sense, right? Which in science we call the sixth sense. You know, the feelings in the muscles and bones and genitals and organs. You go systematically through those. Then you move over to what else can you be aware of? Your thoughts, your emotions, your memories, your intentions, your hopes, your dreams, your longings, everything we call the mind. If you had to spatially locate that, would you say it's in your head? Probably. That'd be a pretty good starting place. It probably doesn't end in your head. But we know from you know lesions to the brain and hits to the brain and strokes to the brain, all sorts of things. It's pretty likely those things are very much originating in your head brain. They aren't, doesn't stop there, but maybe it starts there. So if you want to spatially orient yourself Okay, I'm now all the organs for the second segment, the third segment. Okay, it's probably up in your head. But then you move from there, moving the spoke around to the fourth segment to say, can I feel those relational fields? Even in my imaginal world right now, can I remember feeling them like right now between you and me, Keith, or everyone with us right now, or you know, uh, opening to your family and friends and to people you work with. Uh, the you know, sense of others to- around us. Uh, others and your connection to others. Mm. So it's an interesting thing. It's It certainly could have empathy in it, like, I want to feel you, mm-hmm. but then it's like, I want to feel our connectedness. Right, the quality right? of that. The quality of the interconnectedness. And then, you know, once we started doing it, people found it really compelling. And we added two more steps. One was from a research 
uh, meeting I had uh, where the, the research scientist said, oh, you, there's a cool practice. Why don't you add these linguistic phrases of kindness during the connection part? And that fit well with what we were doing. So the, in the advanced one, you do that. And then with my clients, my patients, they said, I want to know more about the hub. And so I said, okay, well, imagine bending the spoke around into the hub and then wild things happen. And, you know, I, I thought it was just unusual to my patients. I thought maybe these are just unusual people who come to be with me. And so they're just having these kind of mystical experiences. This gets to your questions about the mysticism and spirituality. So then I started teaching to my students, you know, my colleagues, you know, who are therapists also. And they started having the same kinds of experiences of timelessness, feeling connected to everything, floods of a sense of love, you know, this what my religious friends would be saying for them is like religious ecstasy right. just from doing this like 25 minute practice. So then once I had taught it to a bunch of therapists and they were doing it with their clients and finding positive results with anxiety, depression, carefully used with trauma. And in my own experience and my colleagues too, um, working with people who were, had a terminal illness and were dying, were terrified of dying. It was helpful in all those situations then I, I, I wasn't used to doing this, but I started teaching it in workshops to not only therapists, but anyone who was coming to the workshops. And, you know, since I'm a scientist, I brought my recorder and I, you know, recorded the first 10,000 people who did it. And then before the pandemic hit, we got up to 50,000 people in person who were doing the wheel of awareness practice. And so we got a lot of feedback through emails, but also directly in the workshops, um, you know, and, and so we can talk about that, but to try to, to try to understand the wheel of awareness results that were so universal that it didn't matter someone's meditation, history, education, profession, religion, nationality, age, gender, all that stuff. It was neutral to that, um, then I, then I was desperately seeking some scientific explanation for why people, for example, in the hub, when they bent the spoke around, felt timelessness and felt connected to everything. And they would feel almost like they were shifting as if you were walking from, you know, the side of a lake and your feet were walking, 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 and then you jumped into the lake. Right and now, right. you're swimming. Right, it's like right. a like an immersion almost. And and you're saying that this this um, higher kind of transcendent spiritual state that you call the hub comes from really sort of the warm up almost to that is the way in is to focus one at a time on each of the senses, and then the, the of course the inner senses, and then the relationships. And then that ability to move towards the center where there's more uncertainty is easier. Is that, is that right? Please take the time now to subscribe to The Soul of Life wherever you're listening. Give it a thumbs up or write a positive review. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. A phrase that kept on coming up, Keith, was, oh my gosh, it's empty but full in there. And I couldn't find anything in the brain studies, and I tried to look at everything I could find with my interns to say, oh yeah, this is the brain being empty but full. Like nothing. I mean, literally nothing. So I'm going, okay, well, that's kind of sad. And that's, maybe there's just nothing there. But then I was asked to be um, on the faculty at a meeting for a week with 150 physicists to talk about the connection between science and spirituality, you know. So, of course, I jumped at the opportunity to be there. And But these were the experts in both time and in uh, energy. So I would always ask and ask and ask, what's energy? What's energy? What's time? What's time? And, you know, the, the, the take-home lesson from those really exciting conversations was they said energy is the movement from possibility to actuality which was different from a classic physics or Newtonian physics statement that energy is the capacity to do work. Mm. So this quantum definition of energy, uh, distinguished from large object physics like 
Sir Isaac Newton figured out 350 years ago as part of Newtonian or classical physics. Um, but these were quantum physicists who were saying, for us, energy is the movement for possibility to actuality. So I graphed this out on a diagram, made sure the diagram was consistent with what the physicists were saying. These are professors of physics. And they said, yes, that's exactly what we're saying. But then I took the wheel of awareness findings and the patterns from these thousands and thousands of people who were reporting on what they experienced. And it turned out it mapped beautifully onto what you can call a probability distribution curve. So that if what I, what I had proposed in the early 90s was true, you know, um, this was now uh, about 15 years earlier, if, if it was true that the mind is an emergent property of energy flow, whether the energy is within you and between you, but it, the idea it's a complex system of energy and there's emergence. And if, if in fact that were true, number one, then hanging out with these physicists and being curious, you could then say, well, what really is energy? It's one thing to say, oh, it's energy. And that's within and between. That's fine, but that's not enough. You want to be curious to say, okay, what is energy? Now, here they were saying it's bottom line from possibility to actuality. And they graph this out by saying, or they describe it anyway, as a quantum vacuum or sea of potential, like all the different words you and I might share. Let's say there's a million of them. There's a lot more, but there's a pool of a million possibilities. But before I say a word, it's just sitting there as a mathematical space of potentiality. Now, once I say ocean, you know, from the one out of a million chance of you guessing it, which is near zero, emerges one out of one. I said ocean, you know, I said ocean. We share that certainty. It's an actualization. And if I'm only going to say one of five oceans, and then it's going to be a higher probability. We call that like a plateau. So I've selected out basically now the probability is one out of five that you're going to know what I said. So probability then gives rise to a selective few amounts of actualizations. But if you go down to the very lowest place where all the possibilities are sitting, that is maximal uncertainty, right? Lowest probability, which means maximal freedom. Which, I mean, and, and isn't that also, Dan, I mean, just to really break this into something um, practical, back to your, what you said about rigidity and chaos, right? Don't we try to avoid, I, I don't know about you, but I mean, I, I like to know what my day is going to look like. I don't like maximum uncertainty or maximum well, exactly. probability. Yeah, so, so exa- I'm the same way. And, and, and yet you can train your mind to avoid that, that compulsion towards certainty huh. puts us up in these plateaus, which I think are, states of mind. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. Say more about the compulsion for certainty. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you think about it, uh, you know, you emerge, this, this, this next book I'm writing called Intraconnected. Uh, I, I've tried to articulate it and the first go at it was like 450 pages. So we've edited it down to like 190 pages, which I'm so happy about. But now I'm trying to just, you know, get it to, the problem when you say something in shorter amounts of words is people may say, that was too dense. Unpack right. that. Well, right. then you get to 450 pages. But no one reads 450 pages. <laughs> anyway, so it's a little, it's a conundrum, but that's my problem. So, so, but this is the issue that I'm, I'm actually literally editing this morning. And after we're done, I'm going back to editing it is cool. exactly how to explain this. And then once we're out of the womb, um, you have a compulsion for predictability because that means safety and survival. So being in a macro state form called an entity called your body invites a drive towards certainty. But when you talk about the mind doing that, it means prediction. That the mind that's capable of predicting will keep this body alive more. And you know that like when you drive a car on the road. Or- so anyway, so prediction is not just a human thing. It's what any any you know, complex system in a body does. So so we have a compulsion for that. And in our very complicated worlds, we want to be certain like about who the self is and all this stuff. So we make these plateaus on our diagram. We call them plateaus, you know, of parts of ourselves or ways we think or what are called categories and concepts. You know, and this is when I did this thing with Dick Schwartz on, you know, internal family systems work. You know, we may have different vocabularies, but the, and his is an approach to therapy. Interpersonal neurobiology is not a form of therapy, it informs therapy, whatever the, the form is. Um, so in our view, and, and our meaning Dick's and mine, when we got to the end of this two-day event, you know, it became really clear, 
the hub of the wheel is a metaphor for the plane of possibility in the physics perspective on what the mind is as an emergent property of energy that's in these various degrees of probability. And for Dick, that exactly corresponds to his capital S self. And that the parts are, from our point of view, you know, learned plateaus with their particular emotions or memories or thoughts, you know, and I love Dick's work and it's resonant and consilient with, you know, many other ego state psychology and all these other ways you talk about aspects or facets or aspects of the diamond or whatever, you know, from our point of view, it's exactly what you're saying. There's, there's a learned drive for certainty. So this is where Dick and I may differ. I don't know. It'd be great to have another conversation with him, but certainly some of his students see the parts as things that need to stay intact. But in, in, in the interpersonal neurobiology framework, we see them as, you know, temporary amalgamations as a plateau that in many ways you want to recognize and honor however they helped you adapt, but to live fully freely, like you're suggesting we, we, we focus on this, you know, means to help dissolve those plateaus and not be imprisoned by them. So for us, no, you don't keep parts intact. You, you, you recognize there may be a compulsion to do that. I may have a young part of me that I want to honor for what that young part did as a kid, but I don't need that young part to go play with my puppy every day, even though the playful part of me, the playful capacity I have can drop toward my plane of possibility and engage with the puppy and everything that may have happened back when I was a kid can be honored, but it becomes much more fluid than keeping it as a separate noun-like part. And my understanding, Dan, of, of, of the way you're referring to the sort of um, the honoring that IFS does of the parts, the respect that it gives them, a lot of it has to do with the sense that if, if I walk up to you and say, hey, Dan, I'd like to, I, I like you, but I, I ultimately want to dissolve you. Um, I might get some kickback, or I might get some pushback from you. You might, you might um, not want to talk to me or you may want to not be connected to me. So I for, first, I want to form a relationship with you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to respect you and maybe go along with you for a little bit. And then maybe you'll let me drive after, after a little while. And I'll say, well, Dan, what about we, how about we steer over here? Maybe a little bit less of what you want. So something like that. I think it's, I think it's yeah. pretty compatible with what you're... Yeah, I do. I do think the, uh, the, at least the way Dick t- talks about it, I, it's t- totally compatible. And, you know, this may be an over division, but in, in some ways, when people live in plateaus, they start living almost like nouns, separate entities, uh, the, instead of emergent properties, emergent events that is more like a verb like way of living. And, and that's, I think we have to be very careful of any kind of model at all, when we, you know, glorify or reify things in their noun-like certainty, because if we let them become verbs, then we can't really control them, right? They're always unfolding and emerging. But if we can think of them as an entity that we could encapsulate with certain boundaries and ways that it exists or doesn't exist, you know, then we get this compulsion for prediction satisfied. And I think, at least for me as a therapist, what I've noticed, and you know, we, we do the adult attachment interview and do a deep dive into what actually is in your memory system for what happened to you, recognizing these experiences led you have to have an adaptation. Adaptation may persist as what, you know, we might call a facet or aspect or part of you or something like that. But often that adaptation was really, really important back then. And if it's applied with the same rules now, it just imprisons you. So, so you can get the same result, Keith, I think you're getting to by saying, thank you so much for what you did back then. That's right. I, but I see you, this part of you, you know, as being the protector part of me or being the one that's really trying to fit in. And, you know, and I see that role as really being crucial back then in the way you applied it. It's still crucial, but you, you're applying it that way in, when our conditions are different now as an adult, um, isn't as helpful. So let's do this together, you know, so I don't lose my protective function, that kind of thing. 
Yeah. So you integrate basically and you you develop, you widen the capacity of that singular part into something bigger than it might have been at that one point in time where it took on some role that was extreme or uh, very highly probable to your term. Exactly. And that, that, that role was a function. And so you can call it an aspect of you or a part of the many functions I have. My, and this happened in the two days Dick and I did our workshop together. I think he sells the workshop. You can always watch it. But the, the problem I have with the word part is it can be interpreted as a noun. Uh, and even with the students in the room, they said, we are nouns, basically. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. And I'm going, okay. okay, well, actually, that there's the issue right there. Okay, right. <laughs> you know, and... Um, so you're going for something a little more... More to really fundamentally say, look, it, in order to be transformative, we have to define ourselves uh, in larger terms here than just these parts being being the noun. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's so interesting how life happens. You know, I'm in this book that I'm trying to finish. You know, I'm make, trying to make a distinction between living as a verb, and sometimes you got to live as a noun. Like when you drive your car, your car is a noun-like thing. When it comes to the red light press on the noun like brakes to stop the car so you don't become one with everything. So I mean, these are it's a real world. There are red yeah. lights. Yeah, and you need to be a noun sometimes. So yeah. so we're not we're not right. knocking nouns. Right. Um, but it was so funny because I, I went out to play with the puppy for a while and I came back to continue the editing. And you know my screensaver came on and I happened to have I didn't even know this a screensaver that puts up definitions of words. And the word that was there was the word entity which huh. is just what I was trying to figure out. And, and, it, and so I'm going, this is like wild. Of all the words it could have picked, this is the one I, so I'm reading the definition. I'm, this is a paraphrase. But then it says in that little screensaver thing, it says, uh, an entity is a thing, a noun, that exists independently of other things. I'm going, oh, wow. That's exactly what I'm trying to get at as nouns being entities, mm -hmm. clearly defined as the screensaver, I don't know which dictionary they get it from, you know, because that's the idea that everything is interdependent and interactive, and I call it intraconnected within the whole. So we want to be careful, not just, you know, with our internal world, but even how we live on earth, that if we're only identifying as noun like, you know, human beings and we're better than the other beings, you know. Right. We're going to kill life on Earth, and the biodiversity you can see is shrinking. Yeah. So instead, we need to put ourselves in the perspective of the whole, the intraconnected whole, so that we stop talking about us just being a part of nature. We are nature, and we don't want to get, uh, as human beings will do, thinking we're better or we're, you know, as this definition of entity. We are an entity worth just preserving that part. No, we are the whole yeah. speaking from an aspect of the whole, but we are the, we are the interconnected whole um, where there's like a node of the system. We are the system. We're not just a node of the body. Right. So this is where, you know, it may seem like, uh, what's it called? Nitpicking about wording. Splitting hairs. Splitting hair, but it's not because yeah. these words we use go back and reinforce the concepts and the categories that on some levels are the basis of racism. They're right. the basis of social injustice. They're the basis of the misinformation and polarization. That group is bad. Our right. group is good. You know, the in-group, out-group stuff. It's the basis of, of environmental destruction. So on some level, you know, I mean, I, I use the word we, you know, we got to go beyond just me, but it isn't just giving up the internal differentiated aspect of ourselves and becoming a we, you can integrate them as me plus we is we, you know, and I know some people don't like these funny words, but we to me is the, um, the, the internal me combines with the relational we in having an integrated identity, a broader belonging that allows us to say how in this moment of challenge, are we, whether we're mental health professionals or educators or parents or just people in organizations and governments, how do we go forward now? Because the world is in deep trouble. And it looks like the mind, the human mind, 
has actually created the mess we're in. On the one hand, that's something to feel guilty about. It's something to feel responsible for. It's something that can make us feel like, oh my God, what have we done? Mm -hmm. And I think youth are saying that to us as adults, like, what have you done? Mm -hmm. You knew about these problems. You did nothing. Or look at this summit that just happened in Scotland. Like nothing is going to be done. It is so infuriating and frustrating. It's the human mind doing that. So of course, those are all painful, sad issues. The good news side of that is, gosh, if it was the human mind that did this, it's the human mind that can get us out of it. That's the great news. If we could say what that mind is, and in a way, if we're saying integration is health, well, we way differentiated humanity from nature. We've way differentiated people of this color skin or that nationality, that religion from each other. We're way too differentiated. We need to find linkage without losing the differentiation. So we honor each other's traditions. We honor each other's beliefs. We honor each other's backgrounds. And at the same time, we come together. And this is where, you know, we don't have much time. We got about a decade, which goes by in a flash. And if we don't contribute uh, as thoughtful mental health professionals to the larger challenges beyond the individual suffering that we usually deal with as, as therapists, which is very, very, very important. I'm not saying that's unimportant. It's very important. And at the same time, there's a lot for us to do about human cultural evolution to recognize that the mind has gotten mistaken identity, mm. an identity of a separate self that has been around for you know a long, long time. In modern culture, we, we talk about the separation of a self, call it a solo self. And this, I think, is the scourge of our planet. And it's a human mental construction. Really sort of a loss of our soul in a lot of ways. A disconnection so. from our yeah. soul and our, and our deeper capacity to, to, to harmonize. Back to the word you, know, you used earlier, that, that if, we, if we stop listening for that harmony, you know, we will not, um, we'll, we'll destroy things. We'll destroy ourselves and use each other, or use, our, you know, use things that we don't have. Exactly. Well, and this is where, you know, I know it gets people irritated, but, you know, it's a political um, moment now, meaning it's about people and power. Like, how do we help people find, you know, this kind of um, pervasive leadership that is where every individual can participate in what's needed in the next 10 years to actively be involved, whether you're you know, living on your own or you're running some massive company, whether you're the head of a government or you're the head of a family or the head of a classroom, whatever it is, you know, it's, it's time now. I mean, we literally don't have time to waste. And everything I've been doing in the last 30 years about mental health and this, the mind, the developing mind, all this stuff, everything I'm doing now with my energy is about what we're talking about now, which is, you know, how do we actually harness all that we know about the mind in a conciliant way to try to approach these next 10 years so that when we're 10 years from now, we're talking in the same setting. We said, thank God we took a deep breath, realized we were going down the wrong path. It was a flawed system that we had created. And we had the opposite of what Aldous Huxley said. You know, Aldous Huxley said, you know, man doesn't tend to look at the mistakes he's made to then, you know, learn from those mistakes. And in fact, one of the biggest mistakes he makes is not looking at the past, at the mistakes he made. (laughs) So then you realize, whoa, we are in trouble. So so how do we get out of that, whatever, the vicious loop? That's kind of where we're at. It's such a hard thing to do when my wife points out to me that I am in trouble, right? <laughs> because I've missed something or, you know, something has come up, right? Maybe you've had this experience. But when we're in that state of uh, being out of bounds, you, you know, mm-hmm. I was joking with you earlier about being, you being sort of the rebel and trying, you know, that voice inside of you, you know, why, why can't you follow the rules, right? You know, that, um, it's an interesting thing, what you're proposing. When, and, I, and I really want to invite people to look at your work because you bring... I think a sense of 
uh, invitation to this, that even no matter what state we're in, we can actually harmonize with that state. We can, we can get along with it rather than fighting it. And that begins to change it. So even if I'm in trouble because my wife said something and you know, she, from her perspective where she is, I'm out of bounds. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I'm, I can pause, take a breath. Yeah, so at this point with our climate, we, we've done some things wrong. We're doing things wrong. We can pause, take a breath. So I was speaking to an activist the other day who swam in 108 rivers over the summer uh, to, to bring attention to the state of the rivers in our country. And she was, she was saying like, look, this is, this is, I'm doing this to bring attention because there's time, just like you said, there's time to, we have a lot going for us. <laughs> so mm-hmm. yeah, uh, slow down, take a breath. And um, it could be, as NASA likes to say, I, I talked to John Grunsfeld, uh, five-time astro, uh, NASA astronaut, as NASA loves to say, we can always make this worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We can always make this worse. Yeah. Dan, do you have any any um, things you want to share with people about where they can find you, your work? The two web, interlinked websites are drdansiegel.com, D-R-D-A-N-S-I-E-G-E-L.com, and also uh, the mindsightinstitute.com. And we have a lot of courses, a lot of programs that allow you to build relationships with other practitioners, and they can be on everything from, you know, attachment and couples therapy to the wheel of awareness and the quantum view of consciousness. And, you know, um, ultimately all about, you know, helping people's minds be stronger, whether that's individually or in families or schools or collectively on our planet. So Keith, thank you for all the work you do. And thanks for inviting me to, to be with your community. Thank you, Dan. Hey, I've started a community for Soul of Life fans interested in talking about episodes or getting more information about some of my teaching on IFS, mindfulness, and relationship growth. Head on over to community.souloflifeshow to get access to this group of really cool people just like you who care about the show and want to talk about episodes or or hear more, get access to courses, and, and support each other through life. That's what this is all about. Please leave an iTunes rating for the show. And subscribe now wherever you listen to get more soul in your life. I like it and it's not harsh to my eardrum. All right, I will go.